This is the third video in a series of videos I'm making about floods and flood frequency analysis. In the first video, I explain what a flood is with the help of this cartoon here. And in the second video, I take you through the basics of flood frequency analysis using an example from Oregon. In this video, I'm going to give you some cautionary remarks about how to interpret flood frequency analysis or claims about a flood probability and what to uh, think about as you're doing one yourself. And I'll use some real examples. So let's start with my hometown. I grew up in the Win Winona, Minnesota on the Mississippi River. Uh, it is very much a river town. It's actually sort of a sandbar island of the river. And through the whole development of the town, it was used to having periodic floods. So there is a long-term USGS stream gauge operating in Winona. You can see that the record starts in the late 1920s. And between the late 1920s and uh, early 1960s, you got some good uh, flood data here from which a 1960s hydrologist could conduct a flood frequency analysis just the same way we do today and feel like they probably had a pretty good estimate of the size of floods that the upper Mississippi River was capable of and that were likely to occur in a given year. But hint, notice that the axis goes up well above the range that that 1960s hydrologist would have experienced in the first 40 or so years of the gauge record. That's because in 1965, the river crested at over 250,000 cubic feet per second, more than 50,000 cubic feet per second, higher than the previous flood crest on record. So if that 1960s hydrologist had done a flood frequency analysis and been asked to estimate the probability of a peak flow greater than 250,000 cubic feet per second, that 1960s hydrologist probably would have said that it was an extremely rare event, maybe something like a 500 year flood. But what we see as the record continues to the present day is that while that 1965 flood is still the flood of record for Winona, Minnesota, it's not quite as much of an outlier as it looked like when it happened. In fact, since that time, we've had two other floods that have been above 200,000 cubic feet per second and a lot of floods that have been between 150 and 200,000 cubic feet per second. So if we were to do a flood frequency analysis with this data set uh, and fit a statistical distribution to this, a flood of over 250,000 cubic feet per second wouldn't really look as rare as it did because while it's still the largest flood in history in Winona, uh, there's a lot of other floods uh, like it or almost like it that would suggest that this is really a fairly flood prone river in Minnesota. And in fact, Winona is now protected by an 11 mile long levee. The town is no longer inundated by major floods. However, levees cause problems for other communities and you can read more about Winona's flood history and why levees really kind of provide an illusion of flood control in this blog post here. If you have a really large flood, you have to redo your math. In fact, every year you should redo your math, but when you have a really large flood, then that really changes uh, the math. So this is an example from the Red River of the North at Fargo. Um, so prior to 1997, this was the largest flood on record. Um, and then in 1997, they got one that was off the charts, 30,000 cubic feet per second. And there have been some other very large floods since then. And um, so you have to recalculate your probabilities as you bring in new data. So now with about 100 years of record at that site, rather than thinking that the 100 year flood was around 25,000 cubic feet per second, we now know that it's probably around 30,000 cubic cubic feet per second. Um, it's not something like a 300 year recurrence interval or a 0.03 probability because we've seen that happen 
uh, one time in about 100 years of record. And in fact, if we added more data to this graph since 1997, we'd see some more of these really large floods. So what is it? What is going on in that area? I have actually written a blog post about why we see so many big floods on the Red River of the North. It's a really interesting story of uh, geology and glacial history and a northward flowing river that gets ice jams and this really flat topography. Um, and almost every spring in about April, you will hear something if you listen carefully about flooding um, along the Minnesota and North Dakota border or up into Manitoba associated with this Red River. And so it really kind of emphasizes the need to have these good uh, flood frequency statistics and good understanding of the behavior of the river so that you don't end up uh, developing areas that are likely to be repeatedly inundated. All right. But you might be thinking, oh, she just said something about snow and ice jams and northward flowing rivers. What about climate change? Are all stream flow records affected by climate change? Yes. Yes, they are. At this point, it is uh, reasonably likely that a stream flow record that you will work with has some climate change signal in it and in some parts of the world um, that's going to be particularly true if your stream is fed by seasonal snow melt or glacier melt and those are causing the biggest floods and the timing of those or the magnitude of those are changing um, that will affect your flood frequency estimates and you might turn out to be wrong. If you're getting more intense thunderstorms in the summer and that's a major flood generator, that will affect your flood frequency estimates and mean that you underestimate the probability of particularly large events. So this is something that hydrology has been grappling with uh, for a while and so there's this famous um, a piece written about 10 years ago now maybe a little longer, about stationarity is dead, wither weather management. And I know that this is pretty small for you to read, and I can link it in my course, but um, it basically says, hey, you know, the way we do flood frequency estimates and the way we manage water depends on climate not changing, but climate is changing. How are we going to manage water supplies, demands, and risks moving into the future? Um, and this is a tricky, tricky question. So for many things, we ignore it still. And we are still using historical stream flow records as if climate change uh, was not influencing them in, for the purposes of flood frequency analysis. Uh, there are other things that can cause non-stationarity, things to change over time. I've already shown you one example of that. That's the Willamette River at Albany, where dams were added to the watershed in the 1960s, and since then we've had much smaller floods. So if we wanted to do a flood frequency analysis for the Willamette River, we would not want to go all the way back to 1862, because the river fundamentally operates differently now than it did prior to the 1960s. So we could do a flood frequency analysis for the period up to the 1960s, but if we were doing one for today, we'd want to look at this range of flows here for about the past 50 years. Or we'd want to build some more complicated model that takes into consideration how the flood control dams operate within the watershed. Uh, all right, another cause of non-stationarity is land use change, particularly urbanization. So peak flows, floods, tend to be bigger in urban watersheds for reasons that we've talked about before. This is a nice example of two streams in the Seattle area. Uh, this is one is urbanizing over time. This one is not. They both get the same climate mostly the same rainfall and snowmelt signals from year to year, yet we see that in the watershed that is urbanizing, our floods are getting bigger, uh, and in the watershed that's not, they're not. Uh, and so if we were trying to do a flood frequency analysis for this Mercer Creek watershed, we wouldn't want to consider data from the 1960s and 70s in thinking about the frequency of floods in the urbanized watershed of today but we are faced with a question, 
What do we know about the urbanization history of this watershed? Did it all urbanize, say, in the late 1970s, and it's been fairly stationary since then? Or has it been gradually getting more urbanized over time? So those are the sorts of things where you can't just plug and chug the data into an analysis. You have to know something about the landscape in which you're working. Another interesting thing about urbanization and flood frequency analysis is that it tends to affect small floods more than large floods. And so this is a different watershed. This is an urban watershed in Illinois. And again, we can see the floods tend to be sort of generally increasing over a period of decades. But this uh, solid line down here is fitting the uh, bottom of the distribution, so 95% of all floods are above that solid line, and 5% are below. And this dashed line is fitting the top of the distribution, so only 5% of floods are above that line, 95% are below. And what we see is that this bottom of the distribution is going up faster than this one. So our small floods are getting bigger faster than our large floods. So why did, might that be? Urbanization matters because we pave the landscape, because we add impervious surfaces and we increase drainage efficiency. That means that in a moderate sized rainstorm that might have had a chance to infiltrate into the ground, be stored in wetlands, hang out in the trees, now it's going to be routed into the streams much faster and create higher peak flows. And that explains why our small floods are increasing and why in general we see an increase in uh, flood size with urbanization. However, when we start to think about the really large floods, uh, the ones where it's really intense rainfall, um, in those sorts of situations, the rainfall intensity may be greater than the infiltration capacity of even a natural watershed. So you'd be getting overland flow anyways. Or maybe the soils would all saturate up and not be able to store more water. Um, so you'd be getting a big flood anyways. And so in those cases, the fact that we've urbanized the landscape makes a smaller difference relative to the natural conditions. And the way that plays out with historic data is that we see less of a trend towards increasing the very large floods than we do the small floods. And again, you can read more about that in the context of Hurricane Harvey and its impacts on Houston at the blog post linked below. All right, just a few more things. Um, the flood is not gonna be the same everywhere along the river. If uh, it were, it would be what we call tr purely translated. So that means that the flood wave, the peak of the flood, the shape of the flood moves downstream without any change in size or shape. Uh, but instead, a lot of times what happens is that as the flood gets out of the channel and into the fl floodplain and valley bottom, it's temporarily stored and slowed down and that smears the flood wave out. So this is an example from a dam break flood in Yellowstone National Park, um, where they were able to go out after the flood and make geomorphic measurements and reconstruct what the hydrographs looked like and also do some hydraulic modeling. And so what you can see really clearly in this, because it was just one wall of water released um, at time zero and distance zero. If, as that flood moves downstream, the flood peak gets smaller, um, but it occurs over a longer period of time. And the same thing would be true in a rainfall or more naturally generated flood situation. The other thing that can happen um, if your flood is generated by rainfall or snowmelt is that different tributaries coming into a larger river system may not match in terms of the timing of when they're delivering the peak flow to the main stem of the river. And so that will smear out your flood peak as well. And if you're in arid regions uh, where the stream is a losing stream, uh, water may actually infiltrate into the stream bed or into the floodplain and not ever uh, continue downstream. And those combination of things, the reservoir action and the mismatch of tributary inflows and the infiltration loss means that in general, large rivers have lower peak flows. And by that, I mean in terms of per watershed area, unit discharge and longer lasting floods than in headwater streams. 
And that is perfectly illustrated by what happens every year on the Mississippi River, where flooding on the Mississippi River starts up in Minnesota in February and March, maybe early April, and it's still going on down in New Orleans in it, well into the summer. Um, and so the floods by volume are much, much larger in New Orleans than they are in Minnesota. But if you divide it by the watershed area, you'd see it's not as pronounced a peak um, as what we'd see in the headwaters of that system. But they also last much, much longer. They occur later and they last longer. All right. So what do we do? We've got tools for uh, flood frequency analysis. If we have a stream gauge record, we can start to think about how we might route that flood downstream. What do we do if we don't have a usable stream gauge record for the typical analyses, either because we're concerned about non-stationarity or because there simply isn't a stream gauge there. Remember, there are only 8,000 stream gauges in the US. One thing we can do is regionalize from the gauges we do have. So if there isn't a gauge on your stream, but there's one in a nearby watershed with similar characteristics, we can uh, translate the uh, flood frequency from one watershed to another, maybe scaling by watershed area or some other characteristics in order to adjust the estimates that we have. And that's called regionalization. Another approach is to use hydrologic watershed models and hydraulic flood routing models to simulate potential flood flows. And this is really important for creating floodplain maps, analyzing scenarios like dam breaks or extreme events, um, things that don't occur in the period of record and being able to get a spatial distribution of flood impacts. And I will post a link to a video that shows uh, a little bit about one of the popular tools used for that sort of hydraulic modeling. And then finally, we can use indirect methods, things like looking at the mud marks on trees or looking at where debris has gotten lodged in houses to measure the height of the flood after it occurs, use what's called the Manning's equation uh, to uh, look at the slope of the water surface and the area in which the flood occurred and the roughness of the stream bed and flood plain and make an estimate of the peak flow that's happened after uh, the flood has occurred. And all of that is uh, topics for future videos and coursework. Thanks for listening.